Guys, this podcast is brought to you by our friends at Wrestling Collector Shop. Make sure when you need to add new figures to your Fig Fed lineup, you head over to WrestlingCollectorShop.com. Started by collectors, for collectors around the globe, Wrestling Collector Shop has been serving fans the latest and greatest in wrestling action figures since 2002. Whether you're looking for basics, elites, or ultimates, Wrestling Collector Shop should be your first stop the next time you're looking for wrestling figures. So make sure to go to WrestlingCollectorShop.com and use promo code SWOGGLE to save yourself 10% on your entire order. That's WrestlingCollectorShop.com. Use promo code SWOGGLE and save yourself 10% on the newest and greatest wrestling figures out there. That's more than 9%. Guys, guys, before we start this argument, before we start this debate, before we get too mad at each other, you know, as a token of my appreciation for my friend Joe, I sent him, I sent him a nice care package. It's not going to be like a snake popping out of the tin of uh, the nuts jar or whatever, right? Go ahead, Joe. Watch that. Watch it. Like the match, the match made in hell. Where Jake the Snake left the Macho Man. It's just a giant cobra. (laughs) (laughs) There's no snake. It's a garbage bag. Nope. (laughs) Oh my god, I know what this is. (laughs) It's 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 a it's a dead <laughs> <key card. laughs> I walk for yeah! miles inside this pit of danger. It's <laughs> 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 Batista bear. His little butt came out. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I saw the big show bear, I was like, "Oh, I got to get in the, uh, uh, another bear." I got that. For Christmas, one of my friends bought it for me one year because yep. one of my wrestling friends, I would, I'd be the heel wrestling fan whenever we'd yep. go to shows. And it wasn't like heel, it was just me having fun at shows. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. But I would be the one person in the audience who would cheer for him. So now, well, oh man, now he's now gotta, get, you know who I got to get to go with, you know who I got to get to go with him now though, right? No. You know who else was made around the same time and like the same set? Who? Tri- there's a tri- I know there's a Triple H pair. I know there's a John Cena. I don't need that one. I don't need that one. Go I ahead. I will say he's been to the dance. Who? The Boogeyman. There's a boogie. Oh, there is a Boogeyman bear. <laughs> well, now <laughs> on to the fighting. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to A State of Affairs, a debate style podcast where my friend Dylan and I debate some of the most important topics in all of pop culture, including food, movies, wrestling, and whatever else happens to appear in front of us. I am your navigator, Captain Joe Shoes. I am the Walter Matthau of Wisdom. The Jack Lemon. I am Dylan Postel, star of Muppets Most Wanted, star of Leprechaun Origins, star of Survivor Series 2007, where I teamed, some may say, with Shaquille O'Neal. Yes, the Shaq, as in Shaq Fu, as in Kazam, that Shaq, to battle the great Kali. But this isn't about me. This isn't about Joe. This is about a state of affairs. Every episode, we debate a topic given to us at random by our producer, George. Thanks, George. And we debate. We'll go back and forth. This one is going to be a draft style. If you saw in the title this week, Pro Wrestling Finishers. Now, 
I'll go and then Joe will go or Joe will go and then I will go. We each have a a chance to lay out our draft pick of sorts, go to battle, and then uh, the the point of it is to give each other time where we don't argue. Will that happen? Probably not. Probably not. But we're going to try. We're going to try our best. Like I say, no need to talk about last week. Let's talk about now. But let's talk about last week, Dylan, because no after to, you to said after you said that your little victory in the cartoon episodes, which I said Dylan squeaked out a victory with 58%, which he did. I admit it, he did. But I came back with a vengeance for the best of ice cream flavors episodes. And Dylan, <sighs> oh no, it was an absolute, as you would say, Chomping? defecation. <laughs> no with 71 percent of okay. the vote you know what hey i thought it was gonna be way worse i am actually <laughs> angry that it's only 71 percent of the 71 vote, 71 to 29 71 okay. to 29 but with a record number of votes cast Thanks. for this Hell one yeah. So, guys, thanks so much for Thank supporting. You. Thanks so much for listening to the show. That brings the score, Dylan, to three wins for you, three wins for me, no. and one tie. And here we are on to round eight. Oh, but no. I didn't realize it was I, – I didn't realize it was – I truly, truly didn't realize it was three to three. I it thought it was four three, two. three, and one. Oh, no. Last week, we gave out – a Bailey Elite 109, thanks to our friends at Wrestling Collector Shop. That was done on X, Twitter, whatever you like to call it. And the winner of that was at WM Allen F8. Thank you, sir, for listening and retweeting. You were the winner of the Bailey. Enjoy your figure. But guess what we got this week, Dylan? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Before oh, you go farther, me. we had two giveaways last Yes, week. we did. We had the Bailey. And then... We had the gold swoggle bendy, the autographed gold swoggle bendy, and the winner of that one major mark, Omari Hernandez. He did the cartwheels. He did the somersault, and then he did not the very yay. graceful, but he still did it. <laughs> and then he did the yay pick me. Yes, he Omari. Did. Thank you for being team swoggle. So, Dylan, obviously, we had a lot of feedback coming out of the ice cream episode. A lot of people disagree with both of us, which seems to be a running theme here, which I don't understand. Because if I'm kicking your ass in such fantastic fashion, how could they possibly disagree with the Admiral of Awesomeness? But a lot of people disagree with us both. But a lot of people took issue you at one point called me the plebeian of pandering and let me tell you <laughs> did i really i don't remember that yes did you did really? <laughs> because after you yes. said after you said because you are the herald of hypocrisy after try you that said again. try that again you dylan m postal yep esquire okay the herald of hypocrisy you got it right that time which is what Leave I said the first time. It is not. You are you added a K in hypocrisy. Fuck you, man. How about that? <laughs> After you said and argued and pontificated about how nobody likes fudge, you then threw a fit like a small child in an orphanage and said that me... Picking fudge over caramel was pandering because it was easy. And I don't understand how it could be both of those, Dylan. But 71% means I was the winner. And we had some great feedback. People who agree with some. Not a lot of people who agreed with the entirety of our list. But a lot of different flavors out there that it's such a wide variety. You kind of forget how many flavors actually exist. The feedback from this one, I felt 
more feedback from this episode. And it shows in the amount of votes. So th- again, thank you guys very, very much. We appreciate it. We love the feedback. It's so fun for us to interact and 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 just go back and forth with you guys. I really, really love it. Um, the feedback from this one, it was overwhelming how just people were getting so upset at both of us yeah. and our opinions. Uh, but I saw a review on YouTube that stood out for me the most. It is from Joe Uto FKA 4215. Guys, <sighs> stop with the numbers. Joe Zutofka. Put... Is that what it is? Yeah. What do you no, think? He not. just put random letters there? That's probably his name. It might be. <laughs> hey, Joe Utafka. You. He's, so, he's Samoan. He's part of the bloodline. <laughs> <laughs> Goddamn right. Uh, <laughs> you got <laughs> Available at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Joe Shoes. Uh, this, this review stood out the most. This, this, yeah, this uh, comment on YouTube stood out the most. Joe said, went to work, and everyone was like, do you believe the debate last night? I said, I know Swaggle on- eating only the corners of brownies. What kind of crap is that? We now all <laughs> listen to a state of affairs as it's the only podcast covering the real issues. That one <laughs> made me feel so good, like truly, truly good, that it's now becoming a debate at the workplace. It's becoming a debate at uh, in people's homes. It's It's... Just it makes me feel good that we're bringing up topics and and having debates over topics that everyone can kind of be involved in. That one is my review I, of the week. I did see that comment as well. I believe I replied to Mr. Yutafka, we the one, um, and it, it's it's it really is. <laughs> but I love that that even though everyone knows you. Star of six WrestleManias, Survivor Series, what was it, 2007, you said? Yep. You know, even though everyone knows you from the realm of wrestling and knows me as your sidekick, um, the fact that people who maybe aren't necessarily in the wrestling bubble can enjoy this show, listen to this show, and and get involved in the conversation. And this week, especially on our Discord channel, which is part of our Patreon because the episode went up early and ad free for Patreon members, the comments were coming in like a couple days earlier than I expected. So and early. I was like, I was getting notifications like, oh my God, what just happened? I thought Justin Summers hacked into our Riverside and got it early. I was like, Justin <laughs> Summers now has, a, has, has access to our Riverside and is just watching this early before everyone. But it was awesome. Guys, join the Patreon. Pod exchange, patreon.com slash pod exchange. Join it, interact in the Discord. We're having so much fun in the Patreon. And, it's, and it's, so it's much a lot extra of, a lot bonus extra content, content there. Content. You get the Going Postal podcast bonuses, po- uh, bonuses from the Game Marks. And from us, you're getting a weekly show from me called Shoes Clues, where I do a weekend wrap up. You're getting a monthly Car Jomez pop culture episode this month. We did a rewatch of Jaws for the 4th of July. It's actually a movie I've never seen in full before. Uh, Jaws really? has been never, I've never sat down and actually watched it because it's always Let's, just one of those things that's always been around. Landon like I, loves Jaws. I watched loves it for the, for the first time I sat down and watched the movie. So it's good, isn't it? It's fantastic. It is it's a so great good. piece of filmmaking. And the fact that it's next year will be 50 years old. The fact that it holds up to this day where I That's still such a feel... bummer that, that 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 attraction isn't at Universal anymore. It makes me like I remember pointing out to Landon, like, just so you know, Jaws was here in the Harry in, in the Harry yeah, Potter. In the Harry Potter. So, and I, I love I went on it once when I was it was ninety two. I was in my full body cast in the wheelchair, so we got to like the front of the lines of all that. And then I had I remember being terrified of that and confrontation. So scared of the King Kong ride and Jaws because when I was in the wheelchair, they put me on the end of the boat. Like, oh, the, the, so you thought you were going to get that eaten? Goddamn shark with the fire came right up. Oh, I was. Cry- I remember crying. I remember crying on the Jaws ride. So I we talk about this on on the Car Jomez episode. So if you remember at the deli sandwiches tier, you would get that. My co-host Gomez, who's one of my best friends, this is his favorite movie of all time. But 
growing up as a kid in the 80s, Jaws was such a big part of the popular culture. Like it had a licensed Nintendo game. It was always in clips and scenes and references and cartoons and stuff. So I felt like I've always seen the movie without seeing the movie. Yeah. And then when the Jaws ride at Universal actually closed, I happened at the time to be working at Universal Studios. Really? I was a security guard at Universal Studios for a while when I first moved to Florida. And on Jaws's last day, I it was my job specifically to check team members as they left to make sure they weren't stealing pieces of the attraction as to take as souvenirs. There's a there's a YouTube video of the final ride uh, of Jaws. Yeah. There's a YouTube video out there that I watch it like it's so sad to me. Uh friend of mine that has been a Universal uh, guy that works uh, yeah Universal forever. He was there the last day. He's like he was one of the main captains of the Jaws ride. Mm. So he has like very very fond memories of it. Man, it's it a bummer. It was sad. It was so yeah. sad because it's a like and we're theme park guys, right? And we love the nostalgia of things, but at the same time, there are things that need to evolve. It's like Splash and Mountain, man. When we went, we went on at the last day. We, we went, went on, on the last day. The last you and I. day. Yeah. But seeing videos of that, like closing the doors of Splash Mountain, like made me, like gave me. I just, I just thought of it. The old Dwayne. Yeah. This, this thing, and it, man, <laughs> the old it just Dwayne. Gives me goosebumps. And, and then I told Universal Studios put a Harry guys, Potter section there. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Cut it out. We're over it. I'm fucking over it. Shoes, what was your review of the week? So I got two things I want to bring up. Number one was a comment on YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash Dylan Postle to watch these episodes for free every other week. This comes from at Andrew Calenzo 4589. And he wrote, Dylan is a crazy person. Shoes wins automatically as soon as he said Rocky Road. It is the absolute best ice cream. To say that plain vanilla is your number one is insanity. This is your Roy Rogers, your velocity pick. Sorry, Dylan, but you lost for this week. And I thought that perfectly summed up our most nope. recent episode before this. But there was an also another comment on YouTube that not, not really about our selections, but this comes from at Josephus 316, or as we know him, Chris Grocock, he wrote, I, for one, would proudly support the Captain Joe Shoes Society for Adult Orphans. And <laughs> I got a couple comments like that uh, over, the course of the, over the course of the weeks that have gone by since we recorded last, Dylan. And guys, I, trust me, I'm okay. I deal with stuff with humor. Yes, I lost my parents within a year. But I'm okay. It's just how I deal with stuff. And honestly, I would make these jokes with my parents before they died. <laughs> so, you know, I, we, we had a, a, a somewhat dark sense of humor. But when you're going through stuff, it's the laughter that kind of keeps you sane. If you don't laugh, you'll cry. So I try to do a lot of laughing. So the Shuni of the week was the guy who supports your adoption society, your orphanage? No, the Shuni of the week is oh, Mr. Got, Andrew so Kalenzo. Oh, you three of them. So you have three no, of them. the first one who said that okay. you were insane for picking. Well, that's. Uh, but guys, remember to subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you're listening to it. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, just like our friend Flip0077 did on Apple iTunes. He wrote five stars. Remember, it's the only kind of review we accept. Headline is covering the important topics. Shoes and Dylan may not be able to agree on much, but everyone can agree that this pod is awesome. I planned on only listening to the 80s cartoon debate, but left going back and catching up on all the other episodes. Great debates and truly enjoy Shoes and Dylan's passion for the most important topics like best fast food or 80s action movies versus 80s comedies. Give it a listen, and you'll be hooked. So thank you, Flip0077. Phenomenal review, Dylan. Hell of a review. Flip, thank you very, very much. And that's uh, a <clears throat> peek behind the curtain. That's literally what we wanted this to be. It's just fun, random banter that we have in real life and that I have 
with 98% of my friends of just banter and just a lot of arguing, but it's fun arguing that rile each other up. That's what this is. So for you guys to have fun with it and enjoy it like we enjoy doing it means the most to us. Yeah, this is great. When we, when Dylan and I have been a part of other things, obviously we have a little bit of chemistry. We're very friendly and comfortable with each other. So we don't mind insulting each other. Nobody's getting personal, like taking it personally. But for a while it was like, oh, you guys should do something. We didn't know what that something was. So instead we just decided to do everything. And here we are. So now we're going to talk about top five wrestling finishers. But first, Dylan, what do we need? Ad break. Okay, my man. I've gone first the past couple of episodes, so I will leave it up to you. All right. You want to go first or you want to go, go first? first? I will go oh, first man. since since you had a since you had a very, very minuscule win last week. I will Which go was significantly first. larger than your win the week before, by the way. Uh, and I still my... hold the record for largest win after the uh, pyro nope. episode where I scored in nope. the 80s. So nope, doesn't just, matter. Just want to make matter. sure you remember that. This episode is a new episode. I, You know what I always say, Joe? Jo? You say, the windshield the... cracks before the rearview mirror. <laughs> You're such an asshole. <laughs> I'm going to start this week. <laughs> We are going five to one as always. Five, my number five pick is a move that at that point I never saw in my life. I feel 99% of wrestling fans never saw in their lives. It starts as a suplex and ends in a power slam. This move my number five, the jackhammer. He did it. Goldberg did the jackhammer to everyone. From the cruiserweights to the middleweights to the heavyweights of Kevin Nash and the Giant to Kane to Prince Albert. Goldberg's jackhammer stands out so much to me. Because it was just impressive, and he had the spear, which he would sometimes finish people off with. But man, when he just hooked the jackhammer, you watch any, I don't watch WCW, but seeing clips of it, he hooks that jackhammer, and you see the fans raise up immediately. The jackhammer is easily the top five finisher, my number five pick. Of wrestling finishers, jackhammer. I think that's a good pick. The problem is, I kind of don't like you said. He sometimes would finish with the spear, and especially when he was wrestling smaller guys, the spear would look absolutely devastating. To the point where, if you're just a fan and you're just there and caught up in the moment, when he would hit it on someone like Kiwi, it would look like it absolutely. It would look like a zombie film where you cut someone in half. Correct. It was. But like then grotesque. that wasn't the end. He put he put the cherry on top with the jackhammer. And it always... It 98% of Careful. them. We know where we're going. <laughs> it always looked great. And it, man, the jackhammer, number five. It also led... The jackhammer also led to one of my most unintentionally sexual favorite wrestling moments where Tony Schiavone is on commentary. And the reason I brought up Kiwi is because it was Goldberg versus Kiwi. Oh, no. Where Goldberg is... Abs- it's a complete squisher against Kiwi. He gives this massive, incredible spear to Kiwi. Kiwi goes flying. And Schiavone is on commentary like orgasmic, losing his mind going, the spear, thus give us the jackhammer. And I was like, fuck yeah, yeah, Tony Schiavone, you (laughs) put it out there. Man, I just, it impressed me so much. And then like, I remember in the backyards and at that point we were trampoline wrestling. It it was impossible on a trampoline. And we would just be dumping each other on our heads. So... Yeah, Jack is number five. So I think that's nice to start in WCW because that's also where I'm going to start, Dylan. And we're in the same era as well. And like you said, 
This was also a move I had never seen previously. Now, I have seen other people use it since or people that were using it at the same time in Japan or on the Indies, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. So when my double main man, Sugar Shane Helms, would break out the Vertebreaker, okay. I was like, what is hap- What a phenomenal move. Visually striking. Looks like it absolutely kills the guy. It was so different from anything else you were seeing because we were seeing, especially in that era, a lot of overlap in moves between the two companies because they were in such direct competition. So when Shane Helms was doing the twist into the vertebraker, absolutely incredible move that I had never seen before and led to him being the top guy at the cruiserweight division towards the end of the WCW run before being purchased by WWE. And you would know about being cruiserweight champion. So I assume I you have a lot of respect so for Shane this. Helms. I loved the Vertebreaker because it was like, it's like nowadays. That was like the first, like, I'll call it like the indie riffic move where it just looked like yes. he hurt people. Where he yes. looked like he hurt people. So much so that it was outlawed in WWE. He never and even got to use over, it in WWE. I, he thought he maybe used the first it night or so. I thought he used it once or twice, and then it got outlawed because it was immediately like, "No, this is going to hurt someone very badly." It, it, I loved it. I don't think it has the standing power as much as the jackhammer. See, I and I agree, I agree with that because the- it, because it got outlawed. We haven't really seen outside of homicide really using it. Man, uh, as homicide a cop is so much better than Shane Helms's. Homicide's cop killer is so much better than Shane Helms's vertebraker. I'll I'll allow it. It's the same move, so I'll allow it. I I like it. I don't think it's a. I don't I don't know if it's a top ten. I, it's still one of those moves to me that if you see it now, and Homicide's still going. It's Homicide's at like year number 52 in his wrestling career. My former tag team partner, Homicide, by the way, let me put that out there. But whenever you do see it now, it still strikes that reaction in you because it's something that you haven't been desensitized to from having seen it so often for so long. Yeah. Yeah. You know that's a good argument. I agree with you about the staying power. I do because, because we haven't had it for years and they took it away from Shane basically as soon as he stepped into WWE and no one has really used it in a top spot in a top company. Okay. Since then, maybe that's why, or maybe it's just not that great. Either way. I mean, either way, either way, moving on to my number four pick. This is a move that. Up until, I would say, the last eight years, it was just a move. There was a setup to it. There was a whole, uh, like I said, a setup to it, a whole pageantry to this move. Now, it's out of nowhere. The RKO is my number four pick simply because of how it is hit. Out of nowhere now. And it's always the, oh, well, there it is. I don't know. Like, Randy Orton's RKO is easily my number four pick because of how explosive it is. And like I said, I keep saying out of nowhere, but that's why. And I, I, I truly feel that it is a easily a top five finisher of all time. Diamond Dallas Page, you know, the Johnny Ace, it was the Ace Crusher. And then Diamond Dallas Page. I didn't care as much how DDP did it because he held him. He held the guy almost like a front neck breaker. And I didn't care for it because all if if wrestling was real, all the guy would have to do is just go and step back in all reality. Uh, but how Randy, but then even going back to when it wasn't out of nowhere, when he would punch the mat and just viper up in that man, nothing cooler. Not so much so that he blew his shoulder out, punching the mat so hard. And because he was just so hyped to hit his finish, 
But now you see these ones. I mean, the Evan Bourne one stands the test of time. Uh, unbelievable. The, the, unbelievable. I think I think the Seth Rollins WrestleMania one is even better. I truly do. The Evan Bourne one is great because he catches them, but he catches them a little low, which is, I mean, it's so impressive, the, the timing of it and the the positioning. But that's, that's the thing. Rollins. He catches them a little low, but even then, the fact that he caught him at all is is unbelievable. The Seth Rollins WrestleMania one off the curb stomp, it's so high in the air and just perfect. Man, I I love it. RKO, my number four I, pick. I can't really argue with this because, I mean, we could go back to DDP, and I understand what you're saying about the way DDP set it up. But then near the end of WCW, where he was really on top, top DDP, he started doing those variations where he tried to make it that out of nowhere thing. And you would get it where a guy would go up to the rope, but it didn't catch on the way no. it did when Randy would do it. And then when the internet took over and made a meme out of it, it yep. was like Randy leaned into it even more. Yep. What can yeah, exactly. we do to yeah. give that memorable moment, you know, in the, uh, and just expand the kind of the legacy of the quote unquote out of nowhere. And you got some of these amazing things that it just shows you how good some of these people are to yep. be able and it it goes both ways. It's not just Randy, although I think Randy is, I mean, like, I you don't need me to tell you how good Randy Orton is. You, like, if you've if you've got two eyeballs and a heartbeat, you can tell how good Randy Orton is. But for a guy like Evan Bourne to be able to put himself in that position where he can take it and take it safely, for Randy to be there in the moment, one take, you know, it's not a movie where you're getting to do this over and over. And like, yeah, sure, maybe it was a little low, but like the fact that it was even there, the fact that he made it work is just incredible. It's so I can't argue this pick. It's not on my list, but I I do not denounce anyone who has it here or even higher. I. Yeah, it was easily on my it was it was the the, the second one I wrote down and that's how awesome i feel my list is that it's bumped down to number four so it's one of the first ones that came to mind for me and then as i was kind of putting the pieces together i said i'm gonna leave this one out i know it may cost me but i'm gonna go ahead with some other picks like my number four pick by a man who i thought was just the coolest motherfucker that ever existed on the planet everything the guy did just reeked of cool and oozed machismo. My double main man, as I used to call him, Uncle Razor, with the razor's edge. There was something about the character as a whole, the presentation. I when I found no, no, out, no, 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 hold on, hold on, I'll get there. Hold on, I'll get you there. You cannot. I'm no, no, I will get there. Shut the fuck up and let me talk. When I found out that this man's name was just Scott Hall and he wasn't really Cuban, like that actually bugged me on the inside. I was like, how dare you? But the setup for what is at its core a simplistic move, the way he would grab you, the way you had no way out and the way he'd throw his arms out, the setup for it, and then the big drop, everything Razor Ramon did was cool. And we've spoken about the cool factor before. With Jeff Hardy, we spoke about the cool factor. Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, whatever iteration you want to have him under was just cool. And that move, I feel like that was one of the early moves that everybody wanted to do on their front lawns because that new generation era when I got to be a little older, Maybe we could lift each other up a little bit. To do the razor's edge was awesome. So that's why I have that at number four, the razor's edge. Challenge. I'm what are you challenging, challenging that. I'm challenging that. How? I'm challenging the buildup because you built it up as the person, not the move. You built it up as how cool Razor is and how he oozes machismo and how you love the character and this and that. And you oh, you forgot the toothpick, the coolest thing about him. You forgot that. That's the only thing you didn't mention. About I said the presentation, built him up. Well, like, exactly. part of the presentation. The presentation of the person, not 
the move. This the, isn't, we aren't arguing. And I we said, aren't arguing. We I aren't said, arguing. No, no, no. no we no. aren't arguing. No, you little shit. We aren't no, arguing. You. You, we aren't we are, arguing. We are arguing. We are arguing. arguing. People we are genuinely we're arguing. arguing right now. We're arguing, <laughs> we're arguing finishers. Yes. Not and people. this move not was people. awesome. This move no, was no, no. cool. Everybody wanted to do this move. I didn't. I, well, you're an idiot then. And you didn't have any appreciation for what you said is the the core to your wrestling fandom, that new generation. You didn't think Razor Ramon was cool? You didn't think the Razor's Correct. Edge was awesome? Correct. No, I did not. I thought Razor Ramon was cool. I didn't think the Razor's Edge was cool. You, oh, sir, are out, you you are, are out of your you mind. You are out of your mind if you don't think line. that move was you're awesome. You're out of line. You you're are out of line. No, This no. is a challenge. No, no. This has an asterisk. If you win this fucking round, this is an asterisk. Because you, we don't go on you, rounds. I we go on once, debates. I didn't once talk about how sick Randy Orton's tattoos are. I didn't talk once about that, or how cool his entrance pyro is. I didn't talk once about that. I talked about one thing: the RKO. You talked about Razor being a Cuban, but not really being Scott Hall. You talked about oozing machismo, and then you were like, "Oh yeah, his finisher was okay." That's what you no. did. That built you up did. how everything, you, every piece of him about was the cool. Person. Correct. Everything not he about did, the, move, the way he moved, not the way about he the move. Did. Of course, you. The move. I even said the move, you idiot. And maybe if your fucking hearing aid was turned on, <laughs> you piece of shit. Maybe you, you would have fucking heard it when I went did over. This. How fucking cool the whole setup. How he would you grab did you. This. The fucking aggression. How he would throw out the arms at everybody watching. No, <laughs> shut the fuck up. No, you shut up right now. Everybody, you would see it in every fucking video, and you fucking know it. You know it. So don't you fucking do this, you sanctimonious piece of shit. Fuck you, because you would see George every person in the crowd noises. fucking throwing their arms out the second Razor Ramon would do it. And uh, fucking Razor's Edge was the coolest fucking Joe, thing in the moment. Joe, Joe, take a hit of your, your Pepsi Zero. And here is what I was saying with this before you got all hot and bothered. You built up the person and then the move. I... Going according to this list and this debate, I'm just talking about the move very simply. Oh, so, so let's just do let's just do a little list then. Okay. <laughs> Razor's edge. The end. Move on. What's number three? I mean, if you would have talked about how cool him picking him up in the in that position, in the T position, I would accept that. Landing the guys on the top of their shoulders and neck area, I would have accepted that. The setup. And then in WCW, where he would sometimes do the, the, the cigarette in the back. Great. And then you can even talk about how it's so cool that Damian Priest does it now and does it very well, I will say. I don't you know who that talked, is. You could have talked about that. But you, you went askew with your argument. But it's okay. I'll accept it. Hey, hey, I'll accept it. I'll accept it. <laughs> What's your number three? Just list it. So that, that's it. We'll, <laughs> that's all we're doing my now. No- it's a fucking list. <laughs> my number three. My number three pick. I talked about hitting RK on No, 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 no. Talk about the fucking move. Where's the move? Another what is it? move. No, 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 no. What, what's the name of, of it? No, no, Come no, on. No. What's, the, what's the name of it? I want to hear it. We're supposed to give time. No, you don't. We're not. We're here to make a debate. You don't want to make a debate where you just want to fucking list bullshit and keep going. So fucking. I mean, I don't know. You got something fucking better to do. The so stunner. fucking list the move. Let's the go. Stone Cold Stunner hit out of nowhere during what is argued to be the biggest time in wrestling. The biggest time in wrestling. He hit that stunner. He would come in clean house with simply a kick in the guts and a stunner. He would take out a dozen people just feeding, kick in the guts, stunner, bang, kick in the guts, stunner, bang. You knew what else was coming with it, but all you wanted to see was a stone cold stunner. People were going to raw to see a stone cold stunner. That's how big the stone cold stunner is. My number three pick, the stone cold stunner. I don't know. Again, that's a move where I feel that could be number one 
for a lot of people. I really do. And it's such a historic known move. I feel like the Stone Cold Stunner. I I had a hard time not putting it in my number one, but it's my number three. It it was ex- again explosive. It was out of nowhere. It got people on their feet. Stone Cold Stunner, number three. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, okay. You have no I'm argument to, to the stunner. Can I talk about my move now? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. What do you have to say about the stunner? It's a move. <laughs> Guys, I got him. I peeled back his skin and I'm taking a little nap underneath it. I got under his skin. I'm taking his little skin. I'm I'm pulling it up like a sleeping bag. I'm getting all snuggly because I got under his skin. Joe, what's your third pick? Number three. After the merger, we didn't have a number two wrestling company for a while. And when we finally did, took a little while, but we were finally introduced to what became the most innovative wrestling maneuver of the early 2000s and has now become a bit watered down. But at first impression, it was an absolute holy shit, I cannot believe that is physically possible maneuver. And that is Petey Williams with the Canadian Destroyer. When you Shit. first saw Shit. the Canadian Shit. Destroyer, you sat there. If you had DVR, you hit pause. If you were on VHS recording it, you hit pause because you didn't believe that what you had just seen was what you really had just seen. It was people tuned in just to see. And this is before we had memes and before we had reels and before we had TikToks. But people would show their non-wrestling friends, you got to see this fucking move because it was that impressive visually. The Canadian Destroyer has now been around for a little over two decades. Maybe, you know, we're still in that area, but it has become, we've seen everyone under the sun do it, right? You see it every week now with some 500 pound guy on the Indies doing a Canadian Destroyer to a referee now. Everyone's seen it. But in its infancy, when it was first introduced to us with Team Canada and Petey Williams, the architect of the Canadian Destroyer, it was a truly, truly, holy shit, unbelievable moment to see visually. Like the vertebraker, when I saw it, I remember I, I saw it. Uh, it was the Wednesday night pay-per-views that TNA did. And I remember seeing it for the first time and going, how how is that yeah. how is that able to be done and i was like man was it a botch because you know what the first thing i thought oh that was a botched sunset flip like it was a weird yeah. botch yeah. Than that. Like, and then man again like the vertebraker i truly feel it was one of those things like holy cow this is something never even i mean who would ever even think of doing a flipping pile driver i I, I I truly can't argue that. Again, uh, in the grand scheme of all that's wrestling, does it hold a three spot? I don't know, but I will say, God dang, that's a huge pick. And I that wasn't even on my list because I never thought of it. That's an enormous pick. I have no idea where you're going from there now. I, man, Canadian, I want to, I, I'm mad. See, I'm before mad. we started recording, Dylan came I'm in here mad. as he does with every episode and goes, oh, you're done. I got gotcha. you. No, no. And you, you did, you, you do. That's kind of your thing. It's kind of your gimmick. And <laughs> with this, with this, I, I'm, I feel very good about my list. And I'm not saying that it's one, perfect. You know what? I will say that one shocks me that you picked it. That I, one's not, very much, very much shocks me that you not only picked that move, but that it's that high on your list. That it impresses me. I'm, I'm, hey, I'm proud of you. Oh, I'm proud thanks, of you, Dad. <laughs> but man, oh, 
I'm not happy that you got that one. I'm not happy that you got that one. Uh, I mean, we can only go up from there, though. At that, we talked about how things you've never seen when that stuff comes out. This was at a time. Again, we're going to the Attitude Era. The, what people will argue the biggest point of wrestling. A move that as a teenage wrestling fan that I was, when I saw it hit the first time. Again, during the era of backyard wrestling and all of that, when we're just trying stuff on trampolines, when I saw my number two pick for the first time, not only did I, but every backyard wrestler tried it. I know exactly where you're going. My number two pick is I know the, exactly swan, the swan ton bomb. Mm -hmm. when, it wasn't just a flip. I hate when like, people go, that's just a flip off the top rope. No. How he arc The photos of Jeff Hardy doing it. How he arcs his back. How he, not until later in his career, would never like very rarely destroy guys with it like land on him land on him it would always be the top of his shoulder blades just landing on the guy perfectly doing it off the ropes to a guy that was you know seemingly a foot in front of him or mid ring all the way in the middle of the ring he would hit it every time and then you don't even like that's not even counting the latter ones like when you think of the top moments in wrestling, Jeff Hardy's swanton off a ladder always is in the top, is in your mind. For sure. How about For Jeff Hardy sure. off the, the Royal Rumble of Madison did, Square Garden at I the Royal Rumble? The Royal Rumble. Well, against that the Dudleys. The, that was the crazy, I remember that was like the first crazy one Royal that I remember Rumble remember 2000. Seeing. Yeah. Your boy yeah. was at that show. And as I was leaving the building, I made a point to walk to that breezeway. Yeah. And I picked up a handful of the table pieces That's that had awesome. broken. I have them in a sandwich bag still with a piece of masking tape around it, holding it closed. And I like labeled it Royal Rumble 2000 Hardy Boys versus Dudley Boys tables match. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's that. That's that. That guys. Even if he wins the episode, that wins it for me. I had no idea of that. That's incredible. Uh, the Swanton Bomb truly to me is my number two pick because of, at that time, the effect it had on teenagers like me. Uh, you know, back again, backyard wrestling or just if you're saying you were a wrestling fan and didn't flip off your couch, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to us. And it, like, Man, everyone did it at that point. Everyone did it off the diving board and they got yelled at by the lifeguard and all of that. Swanton Bomb is easily my number two pick. So originally, I had this on my list as well. It, I did bump it off. It, when I, we, I said I may have like an honorable mention or two that I want to speak about later on, this is one of them. And for a lot of the reason, the same reason that you said, it was one of those things, like I said with the Razor's Edge, everybody wanted to do it. Yeah. And we didn't wrestle. I backyard wrestled as well, not on a trampoline. We would use old couch cushions that we would collect. Yep. Or if we were at someone else's house, they had an old mattress that we would come out. We would have like this tarp that my dad used to use when he was a mechanic. And we spray painted our company name on it, whatever. Yep. And we would take that from house to house to kind of keep all the cushions together because obviously yeah. they would move whenever you take a bump. We so used a bunch of sheets this. and we would use sheets and we would tuck them or then we like, we tried to tent stake them, but then we were like idiots and we're like, oh, that's just going to rip the sheets and then we got to buy yes. more sheets. Yeah. So what in, if we were at my house, which wasn't very often because my mom would be scared shitless, someone was going to get hurt in the backyard. We had a central air conditioning unit and yeah. people would jump up and then she was terrified. We were going to break the air conditioner, of course. Yep. But we would jump up on that and do the Swanton. And every single match had 31 Everyone. Swanton bombs. Yep. Because everyone would at least try it. 
And then there uh-huh. became only a couple of people who were able to do it. But the thing that separated, because people have done somersault sentons off the top rope for a long time. But when Jeff Hardy did it, it wasn't a somersault senton. It was a swanton. It was art. Yeah. So much so that even me, as a pudgy, five foot nine, 270 pound indie wrestler, was made that his first finishing move because even I wanted to do it and I worked on my swanton where I was able to do it passable enough to make it look good and not kill people. And that became my first finish on the indies was the swanton bomb. Short stack would miss it every match on the indies. Every match I I would miss it on the indies because I was always in the then in the backyard, I remember hitting it once in the backyard and I crushed the guy and it hurt me so much because I, mm-hmm. I landed on him so much. I was like, yeah. no, I'll just miss it every time. I taught myself how to do a swanton. I, I just it, kept yeah. doing them over and over and over until I became. And then when I started training and I had access to a ring and crash pads and and where I trained, which was with Johnny Rods over at Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn, old Gleason's Gym. It's, they had moved the location now. We had a very uh, low ceiling. So it became hard to do because I couldn't jump up. My, you know, it was almost my head was scraping almost. If I stood on the top yeah. rope, I was almost so I couldn't jump up. I had to jump out and I had to learn to get that tuck in and still look aesthetically pleasing. Because like I said, anyone can do a somersault senton and it just yep. looks like, eh, whatever. Looks like you're but, falling. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you're falling. But to do an aesthetically clear, and now you've seen the level of athleticism that we see at the top companies on the indies and fuck it, probably in backyards nowadays too. Everything has gone through the, the fact, like it's almost a thing if you can't do a swanton at this point. But no, no. But to see Jeff Hardy do it for the first still time. Still to this day, but still to this day, you can see seven 450s on the show. When he does a swanton, it people erupt because it Every just time. look, it just looks different number two pick even that silly it's not my favorite move and i I don't mean to say it's silly like it's a silly move but the whisper in the wind thing love it if anyone else did that you'd probably be like eh but there's something about jeff hardy the way he does it and that that's what i go to with, with, with razor as well there's always something about the way he does it because it's him doing it you know if i did a outsider's edge tomorrow People would be like, oh, okay, cool. But because Razor does it, it's great. When Jeff Hardy does it, it's great. Swanton Bomb, number two. Good luck, buddy. I love you. I'm sorry. So I love you. this this pick can go a lot of different ways. <laughs> oh, is this your is this the Roy Rogers of the week? It oh, may is be. this the velocity of the week? When I was first introduced to ECW was kind of late in the game. And I had to go back and educate myself with ECW because a lot of the guys early on had moved on already by the time I started watching ECW. I believe the first ECW show I ever saw was WrestlePalooza 98. So there was a lot there, a lot of key ECW moments that I had not witnessed live. And I had to go back and I had a couple friends in high school who really were happy to help because they used to go to all the local shows at the Queens Elks Lodge. They were big ECW fans and they would pass me along the fan cam videos and whatever compilation tapes. And there is a tag team finishing move. This is going to be probably the only tag team move on this list between both of us. Oh no. It was one of these moves once again, where I saw it for the first time and said, Oh my God, the quickness of it. The devastation, the way it looked like it was breaking someone in half as it, as one guy went from the top, the other guy swept out the legs. Saturn and oh, Cronus, the total elimination. Oh, no, it's not the 3D. That's where you thought I was going? Go ahead. Go ahead. Total elimination. The violence, the, the sheer speed of it and how it looked like it absolutely killed the person was wildly impressive at that moment you have you have to jump out of your chair and be like oh fuck that that you know what i don't know what the rest of this but that shit was real 
That shit was real. They fucking beat that. Fucking killed a guy. Total elimination. Saturn and Cronus, the eliminators. Absolutely I- incredible. And it's a shame that they never got to do that on a larger stage. I was really, really worried because I thought you were going 3D. And then you went that. It's, this is way better than 3D. You're out, of your, you're out of your freaking mind. 3D is an RKO. You already said it. It's not even out of nowhere. I, you know what? Every week, one of us has a Roy Rogers. That's the Roy Rogers of the week. If you, or I'm sure. telling you right now. If you were an EC, if you've never seen ECW, you're going to be like, what, what the fuck is he talking about? I'll if give you, it to you. It's pretty sweet. I'll it's give an it amazing to you. move. It's an amazing it move. number two of all time. Number two. Total it is number two because it's shit. It is you, shit. You make that joke every week with my list. Like, it get over it. It makes me happy. Total elimination is an absolute banger of a finish. Like I said, the biggest shame is that we never got to see those guys do it on a bigger stage. I want. Oh, you know who did it? Uh, and actually, actually, I will say this. Um, uh, Ascension did it really, really well. I think was that they what did they were it. Using? Yeah, I, they did it differently, though. Like, a, was it a cross body or something? They did it differently. But it, they did it the the you know the high low essentially, and they did it very very well. The, the thing was, that made Saturn and Cronus so because like you look at like Saturn was, was always fast. I'll say that it was very it's very the fast. Speed, the speed, yeah, of it. yeah, Especially yeah. Especially yeah. when you look, okay. if you don't know Cronus, you look at him and he looks like sloppy, almost looks homeless in a lot of situations. Cronus was fucking incredible athlete, man. The shit that he could do, and Saturn was so good. You know, like when he, he had a, a pretty decent, solid run in WCW, had some time in WWE, obviously, but their run as the Eliminators, they were just sometimes they're just some guys who click and that kind of belong together. And Bubba and Devon, good example, right? You put Bubba and Devon together, you've got this package that when you split them apart, I know Bubba had a world title run in TNA. I, I get that. But Bubba without Devon is not a package I'm worth buying. I'm I'm really looking to buy into. And that was where with Saturn and Cronus, when you see the Eliminators, you're like, oh my God, these guys are amazing. And that finish, the speed they did it, the athleticism they did it with, how violent it would look, it genuinely looked like it was killing the guy. Incredible finish. I'll give you that. Not as number two, but I'll give you that. That I said, you know what? Sometimes you got to take chances here. You got to. It's the sideways pyro of this list. It is. Yeah. It really is. Ladies and gentlemen, friends. Now, we've went through this list, and it's been impressive. It's been very. But impressive. I, I know yours is a, is a gimme. It's just it's the, been... the ultimate warrior's finish, the entrance. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. I don't talk about the character. I talk about the finisher. That was his uh, finish. <laughs> we talked about impressive looking moves. I talked about the swanton. I talked about the jackhammer. To me, the single most impressive looking move. The last ride. The no, last really. ride. I love the last ride. It's like the Swanton to me. I can watch it all the time. All the time. I love, I, I know that face. I truly love the last ride. I, man, when he did it, I, I think it like the, probably the first time I really like it stood out, stood out. He did it to Edger Christian and just hoisted him so freaking high in the air. It blew my mind. It blew my Undertaker is a huge human as is. Just doing a powerbomb would be cool, but there was powerbombs all over the place. Sid. Especially Diesel. at that time. Yeah. Like I said earlier, uh, once we had those two big companies, we had a lot of crossovers with people ripping off Undertaker everyone's finisher on both shows. doing a, the last ride, man. It impressed me. Because also, you know what I think another cool part about the last ride to me was? was everyone expected him to do a tombstone. Undertaker's coming back, even as the American badass, with 
easily. I mean, top 10, if not top five, sickest entrances of all time. Bob, or, uh, American Badass was great. Rolling. Rolling. You done it now. Man, that was good. Man, but you, you expected him to do a tombstone. When he pulled out a last ride. Mind-blowing. I love the last ride. The last ride is easily my number one pick. You know, I'm very taken aback that this was your number one pick. Because I will say, as someone who has made it clear, I've, I've never been an Undertaker fan. That is my favorite version of The Undertaker. But even then... The last, I, I like that it's a different wrinkle that he puts on it to make it his yeah. own, yep. which is good to separate himself from the other, the other big guys that were doing it, obviously. Um, but man, I have never thought about that move in that way at all, ever. I love so it. So the fact that you had it on your list at all, let alone what? number one, number really, one, really, that was, hey, I, I'll say this. That surprised that- me. When we, when, when George, thanks George, gave us the topic, uh, that was the f- legitimately the first move that came to mind. The first move that came to mind was the last ride. Well, Dylan, as usual, you have made an egregious error in judgment because my number one is actually the first one that came to everybody's mind. But apparently for you, it was only number three. The Stone Cold Stunner. The everything you had said still applies. It's the way. It's the quickness. It's the fact that that's all he needed. It's the way it made the fans feel. It's the way that every kid in school was doing it to each other in the hallways nonstop throughout 1998, 1999, 2000. For years, it transcended. It was not just a wrestling move. It was a pop culture phenomenon. The Stone Cold Stunner was being done by rappers, musical artists, actors, celebrity deathmatch on MTV when that was big at the time, was doing stuff with Stone Cold so they could have claymation stunners during the halftime Super Bowl extravaganza that they were doing. The Stone Cold Stunner was the move that everybody does whenever you need a pop because Amen. it is the most instantly recognizable move yep. that exists. You know what Dylan's move, his go-to move is when he needs a quick pop to get right. out of the ring? A stunner. You know what Captain Joe Shoes' move is to get a pop when he needs something now? A stunner. Why? Because it is something that Everybody knows, and yes, there has been many variations of it. Just in 1999 alone, we had the whippersnapper, we had the stunner, we had the chart buster. For all intents and purposes, one in each company, all the same move. But the reason it meant more is because it was Stone Cold. And that move, no one calls it anything else but the Stone Cold Stunner. It it may be the easy answer. Maybe I'm the plebeian of pandering once again, Dylan. I mean, you're you're essentially you're you're Wilt. I will say you're kind of being Wilt Chamberlain again, but I can't I can't argue this one. I it can't. It is can't. a move that absolutely. It's not just the biggest wrestling move. It's just, it's a pop culture we, move. We talk about pop culture. We talk about that a lot, and and nostalgia is a big thing that we talk about. And you know, man. There are Damn. very few things. I wasn't. Hey, man, I'll give you this. I'll say this. You said you weren't expecting Last Ride because it's the randomness. I wasn't expecting Stone Cold Stunner from you at number one. Why I do just you think didn't, I didn't comment on it when you said it? I, 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 man, <laughs> pisses me off now that you have that as your one. I... You can't, guys. There's, there's, there's. Is, this it, is, the, like, uh, is it obvious? Can't. I know you it can't. is. I know it is. You can't. But no, 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 no. Sometimes this one, obvious. this one, this one. This one. I will not argue obviousity. Um, 
Obviously. I'm not going to. Ob- obviously. Yes. Ob- uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Dylan's made up word of the week? Are you writing it down right now? <laughs> I want to make sure because in, in case George is keeping a, ta- uh, a tally to do your dictionary Ob- one day. Obviously. 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 And whatever it was. Guys. I There's can't a part of me that, that thinks you mean ovulate. Argue. No, I didn't mean ovulate. I meant obviously, <laughs> like how obvious something yes. is. The ovulicity of it. Uh, I can't argue that. And I wish I could. I, I, I wish I could. I, son of a bitch, I wish I could. This is a debate podcast. And this is truly, I don't have a debate for that being your number one. Especially with the rest of your shit list. I can't debate oh, the stunner goodness. being... <laughs> I can't believe, be, you know, man, that's a, that's a great number one. We talked about it, about how it's out of nowhere, how he would do a dozen of them. He would clear the ring. People would. It, it could have been, you could have just had a line. Like if you've ever watched old Looney Tunes cartoons where Bugs yeah. Bunny plays every position yeah. and he's catching. the. That's what Stone Cold was. Stone Cold was Bugs Bunny just mowing through full teams of people at a time doing what? Kick to the gut, stunner. Next, kick to the... It was like walking into a bakery on a Sunday morning and taking a ticket just to wait your turn to go to the counter and feed for a stunner. And you know what? It never got old. Whenever we get Stone Cold coming back now, and believe when I was... When Stone Cold was at his peak, I was like one of these 17-year-old snarky fuck smart marks like you yep. thought like, ah, eh, all he does is kick and punch. I want to see Dean Malenko. And at some point, like finally, I just said, have fun. Like, look at him. Look at all this fun everybody is having watching him kick and punch. I want to be part of that fun too. I, and now I when I see argue, Stone Cold, I, can't I go argue back and to it. Pisses, and it it just, pisses me off. It pisses me off that I can't argue of that being number one. I can't. I really like my list. I, I, I love my list, but I cannot argue that being the number one. So, so that, that as was a recap, my one. but hold, as hold on. A, There's yeah. a, a couple things I want to mention. Some things that got left off my list. Number one was okay. the Swanton bomb. And we spoke about that. Yep. Another one I left off. I had on, and I really want to put it on Rob Van Dam, the five star frog splash. Listen, we, We've seen every, we've seen so many really Agreed. good frog splashes. Eddie Guerrero, phenomenal frog splash. RVD, D- RVD kills it. D'Lo Brown, to- phenomenal frog. Dominic Mysterio does a good frog splash now. Great one. But there is nothing like a Rob Van Dam five star frog splash. Once again, the way Jeff Hardy made it look artistic is the way Rob Van Dam made a somewhat common move look like so much more. The height he was able to get, the distance across the ring that he could clear, the way he sold it when he would come crashing down on the person and grabbing his ribs and then rolling over as he tried to gasp for breath after having it knocked out of him. Rob Van Dam made that move look like so much more. You know, you, one, you talk. Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you no, you no, do no, your honor. My, go, go my one of my honorables was the Styles Clash for the simple fact that at that point I, I never it. saw anything like it, like your PD Williams and like your Verta Breaker. Um, that was an honorable mention of mine. But I also thought it's. I mean, to me, and I know I included. Uh, you know, the RKO is a newish one, but um, I was like, ah, is that? I don't know if it stands the test of time. I really don't. Um, that's why I kind of didn't include it on mine but we've seen him hit it on you know uh, small guys and medium sized guys and then on bigger guys like Samoa Joe so we've seen mm-hmm. him hit it on on bigger guys and it's it's just an very I, I remember the first time I saw it I go man that's awesome that's yeah. incredible no I, agree. Well, I it was a move I thought about I ended up leaving it off obviously but it was definitely something in the think tank the last one I have to me and I know I'll be corrected on this I kind of feel like it was the original finisher. And just like the Canadian Destroyer has been watered down tremendously over time to where it's just another transition move now. But the Jake the Snake DDT. Uh, Yeah. It's the first move move that I can ever remember 
the crowd chanting for DDT. DDT. Well, well, yeah, not only that, but I, it's the first move to me that I remember the crowd when it got when it hit the crowd reacting to. You they know what knew I mean? It was like, over. Yeah, Hogan would hit the leg drop and all that, and that was a big thing. But if you watch it like that and like the, the Warrior Splash, people would count the three. When you watch Jake hit his DDT, people popped for the move. It's a very yeah. weird thing that I've just recently like noticed. And uh, yeah, you're exactly right. And because it was, it was so established that when he hits it, it's yeah. over. Done. That all of Jake's big matches are worked around hitting it. the singular move. Yep. Like with Austin, the stunner is phenomenal. We all love it. Like I, like I said, but it wasn't the work in the match. It was just Austin's going to beat you up and wear you down to the point where he can get this. Jake would set up the match trying to go for that DDT. He would, he and would, he would hook you. He would hook you 30 seconds in. He took you 30 yeah. to set it up, to put it in your mind that he could get you at any time. And that's how dangerous that move was that you need. And so his opponent. Would yeah. then have to change their strategy and be like, not only do I have to tr- worry about Jake the Snake Roberts, but I got to stay out of that fucking DDT. Uh, I had a similar my 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 last honorable mention or my second and my last one was uh, Shawn Michaels super kick, and I think I took it off because like the DG the super kick is so watered down and and mm-hmm. just like overdone now. I think that's what like rubbed me the wrong way about including it on it. Man, you talked about the DDT, about how people would chant DDT. The Shawn Michaels super kick, name a time before that people came for a finisher when he would start tuning up the band. You you never saw that. It started in the, you know, the new generation era where we start tuning up the band and people would get behind it so much. And then he really started like Randy Orton. He would start hitting it more out of nowhere. And it was great. I, I but that was, it didn't make my list. So with that, Obviously, iconic finisher. And, and that's the thing. To, to be an iconic guy, you probably have some kind of finisher that everyone does. With Sean, for whatever reason, and I like, I, I liked Sean, you know, so this isn't like, oh, I'm not a Sean guy. But this, I always hated the tuning up the band. Because if you're the opponent, uh, yeah, you hear it, you hear the crowd, just why don't you ring. just slide right the, the fuck out? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always got hyped for it. You know, like, like there like were some things like I understand yep. Randy's punch in the mat and stuff, but there was always an element to the RKO where he could just grab you and do it. Yeah. With Sean, for a long time, he had to go through that exact process. Yep. And I especially think of a guy like Bret Hart because Bret Hart was a technician in the way that he would work you like a carpenter. Yeah. He's got to he's got to go from point A to point B. This is his formula, his blueprint for how he wins the wrestling match. And none of us have submissions on our list, right? Nope. It's very difficult to have that big pop moment with a submission. But I think if anyone was going to have that, it would be Bret Hart because he got that sharpshooter over to a point where people really did get behind it. Yeah. No, I, 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 man, this is going to be a battle. This is going to be a battle. Guys, as a recap. As a recap, my list, the top five finishers of all time. Five, the jackhammer. Four, the RKO. Three, the stunner. Two, the swanton bomb. And one, the last ride. And over on Captain Shoes' list, we have number five, Sugar Shane Helms with the vertebraker. Number four, the razor's edge. Number three, the Canadian Destroyer. Number two, Total Elimination. And number one, I mean, this is a gimme, the Stone Cold Stunner. Guys, that's going to do it for this episode of the State of Affairs. Make sure to follow us on all forms of social media, at Affairs Pod, whether it be Twitter slash X whether it be Instagram, whether it be TikTok, at Affairs Pod, make sure to hit that follow button. It really, really means a lot. So you can see when the polls go up, when the giveaways go up, and you can be the first to know about all of that. 
I right. We are bribing you to follow us with the giveaway of Axe and Smash Demolition. Huge giveaway. Wrestling Collector Shop exclusive. Axe and Smash, you get them both. So make sure you're following because it could be on any form of social media. Instagram, TikTok, X could be anywhere. So make sure you're following across all of them. Guys, I... I'm your co-host, Dylan Postel. You can follow me on all social media at Dylan Postel, youtube.com slash Dylan Postel, where if you're just listening to this, you can watch the free video version right there along with video diaries, along with unboxings, along with small talk interviews, all of that, youtube.com slash Dylan Postel. Make sure, as we said before, check out our Patreon, where it's our show, where it's going Postel. And where it's our friends over at Game Marks Pod, George Feast, Johnny Clash, or as we know him as Caroos. They're our partners in crime at Pod Exchange. Patreon.com slash Pod Exchange. P O D X C H A N G E. Along with not only ad free listening, there are a ton of bonus content on there as well. Patreon.com slash Pod Exchange. Sign up today. And I'm Captain Joe Shoes everywhere on social media at The Joe Shoes, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all that good stuff. YouTube.com slash Joe Shoes for my food reviews, which I've been neglecting a little bit, but I'm hoping to get back on there shortly. And of course, if you'd like to support even further, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Joe Shoes. Guys, it's been a hell of an episode. It's been a hell of an episode. This really has been. We got angry. We got very, very angry. We uh, we we saw each other's uh, opinions, but what make matters the most is what you think. Let your voice be heard, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's in a review on YouTube, or comment on YouTube, or a review on wherever you find this audio podcast. We want to hear from you. Also, if you'd like to advertise your goods or services, you can reach out to affairspod at gmail.com. We'd love to represent you for your love of us. But without further ado, goodbye from me. Let's make like Tom and Cruz. I hate you. Ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-